All week long we've been talking about battles. All week long we've been talking about a battle that we can't win. Apart from the goodness, the grace, the power of Jesus Christ. The finished work of the cross. We're going to sing about the freedom that some of you are living in for the first time right now.
thank you for this hope that we have in Christ. Tell us your whole name and where you go to school and stuff like that right um, quick. I'm Allie and I'm going to North Soto and I'm going to be a junior this year. Awesome. All right. So Allie's going to lead us in uh, the reading of God's Word today. So your Bible should be open to Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13 is where we're going to be. And so power up your device, open up your Word, uh, whatever you got. And as you get there, stand with me. So as you get to Matthew 6, stand with me. Allie's going to lead us in our statement to remind us what uh, this precious gift is that we are holding in our hands. All right, Allie. This is the Word of God for, for the, the people, people of God, God to know, know the will of God and, and to do it. it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, we ask today that, um, as Ali has blessed us with the reading of your word, that by your spirit you would bring understanding, that God, we would embrace your word today and be embraced by it. God, that we would possess your word today and be possessed by it. Lord, we would not leave out of this room the same way that we entered into it. God, give us a new sense of confidence in the victory of Christ, not only over temptation, but over the evil one. Lord, we thank you for the gift that is that victory. We receive it, and God, we choose today to live in it. We pray this in Jesus' name. God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. Thank you, Allie. All right, so your Bibles are open. You should have a study guide handy uh, as we walk together through a conversation uh, about this last petition in the Lord's Prayer. Now remember, as we've talked about the Lord's Prayer, are we talking about a prayer that we should recite? Yes, absolutely. I hope that in your prayer life, that uh, reciting the Lord's Prayer will become a, a part of your regular worship. That you will, before the Lord in prayer, just pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it also becomes for us a pattern to follow. And so, in other words, what it's become for me over the last several weeks is a way to evaluate my praying. So I, I want to be sure that all of my praying follows this pattern. And so I hope this very same thing happens, is happening for you, that your prayer life becomes one that, that is satisfied only with the eternal purpose of God, right? Our Father... And have it hallowed, holy, set apart, great be your name. We should, we should be aching for his victorious presence on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom comes, your will be done. We should be petitioning, daily asking for his sufficient provision. In other words, daily recognizing every day, God, I want just enough to accomplish your will, right? I want just enough to, that your kingdom might come, your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven, that your name might be hallowed. God, we are seeking your divine pardon. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. In that way, we learned that being a forgiven person means that I will be a forgiving person. Those two things are, in God's kingdom, inseparable. We cannot be one and not be the other. We cannot be forgiven and not be forgiving. Amen? Oh, <clears throat> that was a hesitant response. <laughs> we cannot be forgiven and not be forgiving. Amen? Amen. And in this last two weeks, we've been in this last petition, or last two petitions, really, Lead us not into temptation. We talked about this last week, right? Does God, lead, does God tempt anyone? No. James 1, 13 and 14 tells us very plainly, God does, don't let anybody say, God tempted me. But we do experience temptation, right? And what is God doing when we are being tempted? He is testing. testing. Very good. Excellent. He is testing us. And so we, we know that there is a purpose in the tempting. It's not our failure, but it is the proving ground of our faith. And so this morning we come to the final petition in the Lord's Prayer. 
but deliver us. And, and the word here, deliver, is the word uh, redeem or rescue. Rescue us. And remember, it's so very important that this is a process that we pray to be happening, not just in my life, not to deliver me, but deliver who? Us. We ought to be praying for the purity of God's people daily. Father, deliver all of us from evil. Now, as we talk about this this morning, I know some of your Bibles will say deliver us from evil. Some of your Bibles say deliver us from the evil one. Or maybe there's a footnote there. So when we say evil or evil one, I, I'm seeing these things as, uh, as part and parcel. They, they are they're inseparable. Evil is a part of our lives because of the evil one. The evil one exists, therefore there is evil. And so when we say, when we talk about being delivered from evil, ultimately we were talking about being delivered from the temptations of the evil one. The attacks of the evil one. And so Jesus shows us the way. He shows us the way. The sure and certain defeat of our enemy, the devil. And so I want you to, as a matter of fact, let's just read that together. The Jesus way, are you saying it with me out loud? Let's do a start over again. The Jesus way shows believers to the sure and certain defeat of our enemy, the evil one. And so how does that happen? How does God's word and Jesus' example show us the way to victory, sure and certain victory, sure and certain defeat of the evil one. Well, we, we need to first start off with the, the existence. <clears throat> we need to have some proper biblical understanding of our enemy. And so let's, let's just start with the, the, the very... The first thing that comes to mind when we think about understanding something, and that is it exists, right? So there's a very real presence around us of the evil one. How many of y'all remember the three-circle gospel presentation that you learned on Thursday night? Now remember that we began with God's good design, that God's good design is evident all around us, but so is what? What's the second one? Brokenness, right? Brokenness. And so the evidence of the enemy is all around us. Brokenness is everywhere. Well, how do we process that in, the, in a way that leads to our victory and the defeat of the enemy? Well, again, we have to recognize uh, the presence, the very real presence of the enemy. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. And so we know that in Paul's vocabulary, there was a space, there was, there was occupying a very real part of his world, the presence of a spiritual power at work in the world that was against God. <clears throat> Look at Ephesians 6.12. This will be on the displays behind me. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, right? This is part of your bonus verse. How many of y'all memorized the bonus verse? Uh, awesome. Look at Ben and Tori Oliver raising their hands. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That was the, the bonus verse passage was Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good job. All right. So Ephesians 6, 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so Paul says, listen, <clears throat> all these things are at work. There are authorities and rulers, cosmic powers. There are spiritual forces of evil. And so Paul says, listen, this is not flesh and blood. Some, sometimes when we think about evil, we want to make it into just flesh and blood. But Paul says it's not that at all. It is something far different than that that requires more from us than we can come up with on our own. So when we think about the very real presence of God, we need to be careful of, of not of God, of the, of the evil one. When we think about the real presence of the evil one, we need to think about not doing something. So don't minimize the very real presence of the enemy. Don't minimize it. 
A lot of times we, we try to, to, um, to, to minimize the presence of the evil one by, by assuming that behavior modification is the solution to the brokenness of this world. I mean, if we could just train up children in the schools to have good character and make good decisions, then all our problems would go away. Is that the way it works? That's not the way it works. So it's not in our training for behavior of behavior modification that there is a solution to the enemy. We can't minimize its very real presence, nor do we want to, to maximize or magnify. I, I think that Jesus has a purpose in making this last. The most important part of the petitions that are here in the Lord's Prayer is our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, right? I mean, that's where everything begins, with the glory of God, that His name would be made great. That's the ultimate purpose. Now, for that to happen, we've got to be delivered from the evil one. But we don't want to maximize or magnify that. We, we, don't, want to, um, we, we don't want to be overwhelmed or um, we, we don't want to be obsessed with the devil. That's not a goal. N nor do we, do we me-size the enemy. A lot of folks just me-size the devil. In other words, they, they say, well, if I could just get my life together, if I could just work harder, if I could just exercise more discipline in my life, then I could defeat this thing. Friends, you are not the solution to the present, the very real presence of the enemy in your life. You're not the solution. So don't minimize, don't maximize, don't me-size the enemy. He has, oh, there's a verse I want to say here. <clears throat> No, I don't. He has... Oh, I do too, dear. Look, look at verse 13. I don't want to forget this. This is very, very important that we understand the, the structure of these, this petition. Jesus commands us to pray for God to do something that we cannot do for ourselves. So, under the category of not me-sizing, not me-sizing the enemy, Jesus says to pray to God, our Father in heaven, to deliver us, to rescue us, to redeem us, right? And so what he's saying is, ask God to do something for you that you cannot do for you. Jackson just alluded to this just a moment ago. And so I cannot be, I cannot deliver myself from the enemy. And the structure of these words makes that very, very clear. Not only that, but the structure of these words helps us to understand that what God does through, our, through, through faith in Christ and because of His grace, God begins something that has an ongoing effect in our lives. So, when Andrew, Brody, and uh, another kid that Daniel told us about a minute ago, <clears throat> when, they, when they professed Jesus as their Savior, God began the process of delivering them from evil that will find its culmination and completion in heaven one day. But until that day, the power of their deliverance is still being applied to their lives day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. God is delivering us. So it's a thing that, that happened, is happening, and will happen. Amen? So that's what God's doing in our lives by delivering us from evil. Don't minimize it. Don't maximize it. Don't me-size it. Trust in God alone to do what only He can do in your life. The enemy has a very clear purpose. He has a very clear purpose. One of the misconceptions and myths about the devil is that he's like this party planner. Right? Like, like the devil just, well, he plans the best parties. I, I'm going to, some people think in their minds incorrectly, unbiblically, that, that hell is just a big party. Right? This is like hedonism on steroids. I can do whatever I want to do. But that's not hell. And that's not even here. The devil's not just a party planner. He has a very clear purpose. It is first of all to oppose God. He exists always in opposition to God. From the moment that he chose to rebel against God in heaven, he has existed in opposition to to God. Isaiah 14 de describes for us the downfall of the king of Babylon. But in it, we hear, in the downfall of the king of Babylon, we hear, we see, 
an illustration of the downfall of Satan, of Lucifer, the great angel that fell from God's presence. Isaiah 14, 14, describing the character of that rebellion, says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. And what, what, is, what does Satan do in the Garden of Eden? With Adam and Eve. What does he do there? God doesn't want you to know what he knows. God doesn't want you to be like him. That's why he's withholding from you this fruit. He's keeping you from something. Huh. They were made in his image. God wasn't withholding anything from them. He was protecting them from themselves. But the enemy comes along and he opposes God in every good thing that God wants from you. And so think about that. If every good and perfect gift comes from God, if as your creator, God only wants what is best for you, if God created you in His image to bring Him glory by enjoying Him forever, what does that mean the devil's out to do? He is out to rob God of glory by destroying your joy. See, that, that simplify your life. What's my life all about? God receiving glory through my joy. That's it. <clears throat> That's it. And the joy comes from obedience. It comes from obedience. Say, not my will, God, but yours be done. That's what it means. And so the enemy lives, exists in opposition to that. The second thing, the second clear purpose of the enemy, he exists to accuse the brethren, right? To accuse the church. So he is your accuser. In Zechariah chapter 3, one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah, the prophet, has a vision, and in the vision he sees a heavenly courtroom scene, and there he sees Joshua the high priest, and standing in the presence of the Lord, Satan, to accuse him. And so Satan is there to accuse Joshua, the high priest, to point out his imperfections. You ever feel that? You ever feel, hear that voice pointing out your imperfections? You're not good enough. You are not enough of this or too much of that. You ever hear those words? Friends, that's not the Lord. That's the enemy. For Romans chapter 8, verse 1 tells us, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And so the clear purpose of the enemy is to oppose God and accuse the church. <clears throat> Understand that. Understand, finally, that the enemy has limited power. Limited power. The evil one is not an equal opposite of God. This is the dumbest picture I've ever seen in my life. It's, it is, it is, this is the dumbest thing. Because when you look at that, fake bearded Jesus, ugly, that looks like they're equal opposites, doesn't it? Like the devil has a chance here. Does the devil have a chance? No, 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 no. Jesus and the devil are not arm wrestling on the cross. Jesus is crushing his head on the cross. He is a defeated enemy. That cat is a dead man walking. And that victory of Christ is yours. We have to understand that his power is limited. It's limited. There, there's, there's several ways that the Bible talks about this. It is limited, but for now, it is expensive. 1 John 5, 19 that tells us that, that we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 6, 
Jesus is being tempted by the devil. And listen to what the devil says when he's tempting him with the kingdoms of the world. To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me. And so the devil's power is limited, but for now it is expansive. I mean, you would agree with me, right? It's everywhere. Everywhere you turn and look, it's everywhere corrupting the good that God has created for his creation. He exists opposing God, accusing the brethren in this limited power. Well, here's three things about this limited power. First off, it has a limited reach. It has a limited reach. And so the enemy, and I love this, Brody Williams came up to me and he had doodled on his outline. He said, here is the best example, illustration of the enemy. And he had a dog on a leash. He said, that's it. It's a dog on a leash. That's exactly right. The, the enemy's power, limited power, has limited reach. He can only go so far. And whose life do we see that illustrate? Job. I heard you say that. Job. Remember the scene in Job? Job opens up another one of those heavenly scenes. Satan is there among the heavenly host. God says, what you guys been up to? And, 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 and Satan says, I've been around the world. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? And what does Satan say? Well, he only likes you because you're so good to him. And so what does God say? Well, then you can do this, but only this. And so Job experiences incredible suffering for the loss of family members and material possessions. Satan comes back and God says, how'd he do? He says, well, he only likes you because you hadn't hurt him physically. And God says, okay, you can do this, but not that. You can afflict his body, but you can't kill him. Listen, friends, there's only so much authority that the enemy is given in your life. It will happen. We will feel the effects of the brokenness of this life from time to time. But I promise you, to whatever degree that you are experiencing those afflictions, its reach is limited. It goes to the extent that God is allowing it for His glory. That's why we can find joy in our affliction. Because we know that what is happening is a result of the brokenness of this life. That there's no doubt that's what's going on. But the Lord has put boundaries. He has stopped it right where it is, wherever it is. And here's the good news, friends. I wake up with the confidence every morning that if I die today, that is the will of God. It is for His glory. It will be for my eternal joy. Amen? Man, that's the confidence that we all live in. Because there's nothing happening in my life that is not under the sovereign will, providential plan of God. There's limited reach, it's limited impact, limited impact. I love this little story from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> Simon Peter's about to deny the Lord, right? And so the Lord Jesus is explaining to Simon what's going to happen. And here's how Jesus describes it. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Simon, Simon. Satan has demanded to have you. To sift you as wheat, to separate you. But notice the next words. But I have prayed for you. Oh, that's rejoicing place, right? That's the place for us to say, yes, Jesus! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he knows what's going on in your life. And he is praying for you. And notice also that there is a plan for his redemption. But I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And then verse 32 says, and when you rise up, you encourage the brothers. When you stand up, Peter, you encourage the brothers. Well, that's showing us God's plan even in Peter's failure. Friends, there's a limited impact because of God's sovereign will and providential plan. And finally, there's a limited time for this. A limited time for this. Continuing on Luke chapter 22 to verse 53, the, the army, uh, they, they come with torches and <clears throat> to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says to those men led by Judas, this is your hour and the hour of darkness. And so, yes, the enemy's power is limited but expansive. But it is that for a period of time. And then it will all 
be over. And he's not planning a big party in hell. He will be sent there to experience eternal destruction along with all those who follow after him. Amen? And so, understand your enemy. His very real presence, his, his uh, very clear purpose, his limited power. Now, <clears throat> notice this also, that the Bible tells us about the exposure and the execution of the evil one. The exposure and the execution of the evil one. Again, this cat is a dead man walking. Look at what Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says. Since therefore the children, and that's me and you, share in flesh and blood. He himself, and that's Jesus, likewise partook of the same things. That through death, his death on the cross, he might destroy. That's the blank on your outline. Say that word with me. He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who were subject to slavery. Friends, for God's people, the enemy is a toothless lion. He is a venomous snake. Seeing him for what he is prevents evil from having more power and influence in my life than it ought to have. As a defeated foe then, he only has the authority in my life that I give to him. The only inroads he's able to make into my life are those that I allow him. The only advantages that the enemy gains are those that I concede. And so what I'm saying there, what the Bible teaches us here is that in affliction and in suffering, I don't have to exchange all of God's promises for what the enemy is trying to pour into my life. I can endure suffering as Jesus did for the glory of God and the joy of the Son. I can do that. Because this enemy that is attacking my life is a defeated foe. He is a dead man walking. He's a toothless lion and a venomous snake. So then what is my experience living out my life day to day as a believer in the sure and certain defeat of my enemy and the victory of Jesus Christ? Well, first of all, we, we are no longer slaves. I'm no longer a slave to sin. Romans chapter 6, let me tell you students, if you can memorize Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, then you can memorize Romans 6, 1 to 13. It's a powerful passage of scripture that reflects on the presence of sin in our lives and the purpose of our salvation. So Ephesians, I'm sorry, did I say Ephesians? I meant Romans. Romans 6, 1 to 13. That's what I mean. Romans 6, 1 to 13. So in Romans 6, it opens up and it asks the question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin so that grace may abound? Because Paul had just said at the end of Romans chapter 5, hey, wherever there is sin, increasing, grace is increasing. So the natural question is to say, great, I'll just keep on sinning. As a matter of fact, I'll sin even more. If more sin brings more grace, I'm all for that. Is that what Paul meant? Heavens no, and he says that. So he asks the question that's being begged. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? And he says, God forbid. Don't you know that you died to sin? How can you live it any longer? And then he goes to this beautiful description of what Christ has done on our behalf and how through faith we share in all that Christ has done on our behalf. And in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, he says... We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Hey, some of you excuse your sin by saying, I can't help it. I mean, it's just the way God made me. That's a dumb excuse. And it is unbiblical. It is a contraindication to what God does for you when He saves you from sin through faith in Jesus Christ. Remember, grace is pardon from sin and the power for righteousness. <clears throat> and so, stop saying, I can't help myself. <laughs> Remember, you're inviting God to do something that you can't do for yourself. Sin is not inevitable any longer in your life. You are no longer a slave to sin. 
Paul would go on in Romans chapter 6 to say, sin no longer has mastery over you. It is God's will that I be holy, unstained with sin. Now, am I going to live a sinless life? I'm not. But does that prevent me from pursuing a sinless life? No. I'll wake up every day and pursue a sinless life by God's grace. And I trust in His grace when I don't. You see the difference? From just accepting sin. We don't accept sin. It's not, I can't help myself. No, no. You're no longer a slave to sin. You don't have to sin anymore. Lost people do. That's what they do. They sin. God's people pursue righteousness and trust in His grace when we fall short of that. So we're no longer slaves. God's people are. We, we live crushing the enemy. We live crushing the enemy. I love Romans chapter 16 verse 20. It says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's a direct connection with Genesis 3.15. The first time we hear the gospel, when, when God says to, to Eve, your son one day will crush the head of this serpent. We are sharing in the victory of Christ when we are walking in victory over sin. I love the little children's song that, that, that I learned several years ago. If I had a little red box, I'd put my Jesus in it. I'd take him out, hug his neck, and share him with my friends. But if I had a little black box, I'd put the old devil in it. I take him out and stomp his face! Put him right back in. Right? And that's what we, when we share the victory of Christ, that's what we are doing. God is crushing Satan under our feet. Remember, he's a dead man walking. He's a defeated foe. You don't have to sin any longer. It has no mastery over you. You're no longer a slave to sin. And so you get to share in the victory of Christ by resisting temptation, choosing the door that's marked trust, right? And overcoming the enemy and so crushing his head. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. We are no longer slaves to sin. We crush the enemy. When we crush the enemy, we loot the enemy. We are looting him. We're taking what he withholds from us. That's the story of God's people all through the Old Testament. Whenever God delivers them from their oppressor, they take from them. Friends, the devil wants your life to be full of sorrow and sadness and defeat and shame and regret. But where He would give you mourning, God says, I want to give you joy everlasting. Where He would defeat you, God says, I'm going to give you victory over all your enemies. Where there would be darkness, God says, I provide you the light of the world. Where He would demoralize and, and, and us, God says, I have a hope that does not disappoint. Crush His head. Loot Him. And possess all that God desires for you to have as your good God. The, or, the origin of every good and perfect gift. Romans 8, 37, we are told we are more than conquerors. Finally, we've got to be ready for battle, right? We've got to be ready for battle. We are not a people of retreat. We are a people of advance. That's who we are. We've got to be ready for battle. And so we've been provided an what? An armor. Okay, so let's do the armor, guys. Students, you ready? So over here on my left, what is that? That is the belt of... Truth. Very, very nice. And then behind me right there, that is the breastplate of? Over here we got some boots. And these are the boots of? Peace. Which is in the gospel, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Then we have the shield of? Very nice. And then God gives us the helmet of? And then this is the sword of? And all these things are given to us to put on that we might fight the enemy, right? That we might overcome him, right? That we might share in his victory, right? Yeah. Why are all the rest of y'all being quiet? <laughs> and you're the only one talking. This is for you too. This is for all of us, isn't it? We share in the victory of Christ by being ready for battle and in so doing, defeating the enemy by overcoming temptation and trusting God to be better always than anything this old world has to offer. Be sober-minded. 
Be watchful, Peter says. Your enemy, your adversary, is like a prowling lion seeking whom he can devour. But remember, for the believer, he's a toothless lion. He can make a ton of racket, but he can't hurt you when you walk in Christ. Deliver us from evil. As N.T. Wright closes out his commentary on this petition, he says, what might, it, what might it look like? What might it mean for us to use this double petition here? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As a way of breathing in this part of Jesus' agenda and vocation, turning it into flesh and blood once more in and through our own lives and lives. Louis Giglio uh, illustrates this this way. He says, we, we ought to live our lives inhaling and exhaling the defeat of the enemy and the victory of Christ. So I, I inhale, I can't. And I exhale, but he can. Right? That's the defeat of the enemy, I can't. There's no good thing in me that is in my, my sinful nature, right? That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 7. But he can, thanks be to God, there is a victory in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so, the reason why you need to think about this this way is because, when are you not breathing? Well, hopefully never. <laughs> and so we're constantly inhaling, I can't, exhaling, but he can. I can't, but he can. I can't, but he can. Friends, that's, that's the Christian life. We are exercising the enemy's defeat. We are living in, experiencing Christ's victory. That's what God means for us when we pray, deliver us from evil. His sure and certain defeat and the very real victory of Christ is yours today, now, here. Hey, what's going? Hey, what's going on? Yeah, I hope everybody enjoyed yourself at the church service there, um, Brookwood Baptist Church. That's, so now you know where both me and Christine and I go to church. Um, should, uh, any chance that we, because you know they rotate us at work and all that, you know. Yeah. So any Sunday that we get a chance uh, to share with you guys the service that we have up, up here in Brookwood, we will definitely do that. A lot of really good, really glad to be back. I mean, it's oof, we've been gone from we've been gone from from here for too long, almost like the prodigal son, you know. <laughs> prodigal son, we come back. Uh, <laughs> Guess the guess the pastor be, guess pastor be like um, the father coming to greet the prodigal son. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, Pastor uh, David Rice is his name. In case y'all didn't catch it during the service. So. Yep. So uh, hope y'all had fun and uh, let me uh, let me let me show y'all around real quick. Show y'all. Hope I didn't show upside down. So. See, we got some, uh, see right here, you got a little waiting, got a little area where, you know, some people will sit in here and watch the service on the TV here. Um, yeah, so we got, um, so even though, even though it's a big church, you know, <laughs> got a lot of members and everything, so, you know, sometimes, uh, some, sometimes some of them will sit out here and watch it there. Yep. Uh, see some of these posters up there. Worship, community, and reach. <laughs> Pretty big place here. Huh? Yeah. Kinda, uh, we just stepped out of the worship center and kids from school and everything. Oh no, you can. <laughs> see over here, we got the well. Yeah, see, they they closing down now because you know church is out there. But um, before, usually before church service start, um, a lot of people will go in here, get themselves a frappuccino or something like that, some coffee, some juice, sometimes a snack. Yeah, we re they really we really uh, well catered up here. So. Got a lot of, a lot of things to cater them to cater you. You know, you come here as a member or a visitor, decide to be a member. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, yep, and then you can even uh, kind of just chill here between services, you know, like you come out of one, like say a class or one service and you're waiting for another service, you know, just kind of chill here. Or sometimes, um, and we even had uh, book signings here before. Um, yep, there's been uh, book signings for different um, inspirational writers. Yep, really good place here. There's where everybody comes in. All right, here with uh, Pastor David Rice here in the flesh. Uh, say, tell, tell us a little bit about. Um, about some of, about some of the best things about the church, Daddy. Uh, yeah, I'm David Ross. I'm the pastor here at Brookwood. Um, Brookwood exists for the glory of God and the good of others, and so uh, we exalt Him as we worship Him, as we uh, share together in the ministry of His Word. And, uh, we pray together and for one another that God's will be done in all of our lives, and we seek to find ways to minister effectively in our community uh, through needs base and, uh, and and gracious ministries all around our city and honestly all around the world and so that's why we exist uh, for God's glory and that will always result in the good of others and we're excited to be here and excited for what God has in store for us pretty much as you can see um, this was something that they uh, mentioned during the service um, challenge week uh, don't know if any of y'all caught that but um, this is what was talking about having on the full armor of God here <laughs> pretty much like this like this uh, fella here <laughs> You see, he's protected. <laughs> yeah, the student ministries with their challenge week. Pretty good, you know. Got some, got some kids. Yeah, kids want to bring up in here and everything. Got, got stuff for them, you know. Keep it cool in the church. <laughs> yeah. That's one of our. Uh, our, one of our drop by you can uh, put like your ties and stuff like that in there. <laughs> yep. And, oh, and they even have we even have a blanket drive here. <laughs> Blankets for the kingdom of that project. Chances are they'll probably have a uh, might maybe maybe there might even be a coat drive, you know. <laughs> but you know a lot of places have coat drives when the wintertime comes. You can get your little coffee over here. Kind of, you know, you come here, you're a little, little tired, but you want to perk up a little bit for the service. So yeah. Get your little coffee there and get yourself going. For the yep, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit will, Holy Spirit will hit, but uh, you still need, still need your physicality, you know. Need both. <laughs> got a little, got some more stuff for the kitties over here. Yeah. Stuff going on with them. Eventually ain't in there. That's a lot. It's, it's locked up for now because you know service is over. But past those doors, that would be your nursery and stuff for the nursery, daycare, and all that there. Yep. And another got another area. If you want to sit outside and watch some of the services on TV. <laughs> yep. <laughs> You know, one one another advantage of this of this area, um, you know, like a lot of, like some people may have like something like, F, um, I can't hardly pronounce the name. Uh, well, seizures or something like that, because you know, a lot of time it's caused by a lot of flashing lights and stuff like that. So this would be a really good place, you know, if you want to, you know, enjoy the service, but you know, you don't want to have all those flashing lights uh, coming your face and stuff. Yeah, you sit right here and be real calm. So. Go up there. And the other end of the church there. And the parent. <laughs> and now I gotta retrieve my wife. <laughs> because she has wandered off. <laughs> she has wandered astray. <laughs> there you go. So. Sanctuary we were just in there. Huh. Yeah. Got a lot of paintings around here too. <laughs> Boy. Really uh it's almost like the uh almost like some um like what they say about the plant in the corner. <laughs> really brings the room together. 
in this case, really brings the sanctuary together. Yep. Another little sitting area there. So, um, so yeah, that's pretty much uh, pretty much uh, what the church is like in here. Um, like I said before, definitely if y'all wanna, you know, join us and everything, you know, in, here in the Shreveport area, you wanna come on by, get a give a visit, and possibly join us. Hey, come on by, we got the doors open for you. <laughs> and if you're not in the Shreveport area, but maybe you're maybe you see this on YouTube and decide I wanna journey out from say michigan for example and just come over to shreveport louisiana just to see this church <laughs> hey hey we'll, we'll welcome you from michigan well, california <laughs> texas anyway <laughs> as long as you, you want to come worship hey just come right on in here <laughs> isn't that right christina yes <laughs> oh she look pretty <laughs> she look pretty <laughs> oh yo go <laughs> oh, is she pretty, y'all? <laughs> no, now she's bad. <laughs> yep, so, uh, yep, and that's a little quick view of what the church looks like from the outside here. Yeah. So, big place here. <laughs> Got the cross on the top. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a, yeah, it felt it feels really good to be back, you know, here. <laughs> yeah. This whole year of being away from being away from here and all that just Yeah. Like I say, it's gotta get back in the groove, but hey it's a it's a, it's, it's a groove I, it's a groove I'm glad to get back in. Yeah. I guess you could say it's uh back in uh the uh the king's back in the groove <laughs> instead of the emperor's new groove. 